Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. I am very pleased that I have got Dr. Marty Klein with me today. And we're going to talk about his new book, His Torn, Her Pain. And you know, I love it when an author has a book that just has the perfect title. And I really hope we're going to help the listeners to get a new perspective on a situation that I think is causing a lot of issues and problems in relationships. So Dr. Klein, I'm really, really happy to have you here today. And like I said, I really hope we're going to shed some new light on the situation that couples are dealing with way too frequently. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Let me tell the listeners, for the people that aren't familiar with your background, let me give them some information. Dr. Marty Klein has been a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist in Palo Alto for 35 years. He's an award-winning author of seven books about sexuality, including America's War on Sex, Sex, Sexual Intelligence, and his new book, His Porn, Her Pain, as well as the DVD, Enhancing Porn Literacy in Young People. He appears frequently in the national media, including the New Yorker, the New York Times, National Public Radio, and The Daily Show. He is outspoken about many popular ideas about sexuality. You know, I, I read that and I said, we are going to get along good. <laughs> so, Wikipedia cites him as an important critic in America's controversy about sex addiction. Marty is an internationally respected expert regarding pornography a founding editorial board member of the Journal of Porn Studies. He contributed to the pornography section of the International Encyclopedia of Human Sexuality and testifies on the subject in state, federal, and international courts. So he recently gave two congressional briefings on evidence-based sex education. Listeners, y'all should check out his blog. He's got a popular blog that's often cited as a source of reliable information and thoughtful opinion regarding sexuality. And you can find it at www.sexed.org. And he covers all kinds of fascinating topics. I've, you never know what he's going to blog about next. So you should definitely check that out. It was interesting that one of the things that I saw that you talk about is porn panic. And we're going to talk about that. I, I like how you said that, and that, that kind of sums it up too. People, it's not a topic that, that people seem to be able to talk about without overreacting to. They either don't want to talk about it at all or or they have to overreact about it. So tell us tell us a little bit why why did you name the book His Porn Her Pain? Well as you said I've been a marriage counselor and sex therapist for thirty five years and during that time I've seen lots and lots of couples and you never see lesbian couples arguing about pornography and you you never see gay male couples arguing about pornography and when you see heterosexual couples arguing about pornography it's never the man complaining that the woman looks at too much porn or or the kind of porn that she looks at the only the only real conflict that you see about pornography is in heterosexual couples when women are complaining about the porn that men watch either the amount or the or the content so that's why I named the book his porn her pain and the second half of the title confronting uh, America's porn pen with honest talk about sex, I wanted to put those uh, couples conflicts in the bigger social and cultural context of the porn panic that we're in the middle of right now. And uh, I wanted to to say how the way uh, to deal with this moral panic that the country is going through about pornography is with honest talk about sex. Awesome. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of having open, honest conversations and there just there aren't enough of those. <laughs> just there are not enough of those. Could we start by saying that you are pro porn? Because you, you do a lot of talking about it, you do a lot of lecturing about it, you do a lot of, of testifying about it. Would it be safe to say that from the offset that you were pro porn? Or would that be kind of a misnomer at this point? Well, I don't call myself pro-porn. Uh, I call myself um, a person who wants to support other people's sexual expression, healthy sexual expression. And for some people, pornography is part of their healthy sexual expression. And for some people, it's not. Uh, what I'm certainly not is I'm not anti-porn. I'm, 
Uh, as a merits counselor, you know, uh, I've seen so many different configurations of relationships. I've seen monogamy. I've seen non-monogamy. I've seen people who are involved with toys and role-playing and, and all sorts of things. And what's true is that for some people, pornography is going to be part of their healthy sex life, either as individuals or as couples. And what's also true is that for some people, pornography is... Um, uh, something that they're involved with in unhealthy ways, just like everything else. It's funny, just because I'm not anti-porn, some people think I'm pro-porn. I'm not. I'm in favor of people being thoughtful and communicating clearly with each other. Very true. So often, people people want to have like an across-the-board thing that like, like a one-size-fits-all. There just isn't a one-size-fits-all. Well, not when it comes to sexuality. When it comes to sexuality, no. one size does not fit, uh, fit everyone. What's true is that uh, there's such an extraordinarily wide range of human sexual expression. Nobody can possibly imagine everything that everybody is into. <laughs> uh, certainly nobody does everything that everybody is into, but, <laughs> but no, no one person can even imagine it because it's so varied. And things that today we consider to be uh, off limits at other times or other places, people consider to be reasonable and, and vice versa. You know, there are some, some things that we do today that only a hundred years ago uh, was considered really offbeat or even um, even unhealthy uh, the the range of human sexuality is so broad we, we can't possibly come up with uh, with a content based uh, formula for what's okay and for what's not okay what what we can do we can come up with a values based system we could say for example that um, all sexual interactions should be honest or all sexual interactions should be responsible or all sexuality should be um, consenting well if we want to talk about values, and of course, you know, different people can, can disagree on what values they want to use to evaluate sexual expression, but I think we're much safer talking about values than about content. True. Sure. Well, and, and this is a show a few weeks ago talking about expectations and boundaries, you know, and, and being open and honest with your partner about your expectations and boundaries and the fact that, you know, this is the, even that isn't something you just have a conversation once about because you know, the thing is what what you want what you need and especially about your sexuality it should change over time you know what you want what you enjoy what you expect what you want to try it, it you know be creative be open to new things you know but what you want is going to change should change i would think my gracious no i wouldn't you know, say what, it should ch i wouldn't say it should change i would say it could change they can change that. You yeah. should, how, yeah, I tell you what, how about you should be open to the possibility that it can change. How about that? Well, I think that's true about life in general. Since, yeah. since, change, <laughs> since change is always going on all around us, it's important to be open to it. I, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who, who thinks that uh, everybody should, should be doing all these different things and should be always, you know, trying new sexual stuff. And uh, I, I think that's been overstated a lot. Um, and I, um, you know, some people think that to be sex positive means you have to, you have to do everything or try everything. And I, I think that's as much of a mistake as having a lot of artificial restrictions on don't do this and don't do that. And I think right. sometimes people talking about sex intimidate their audiences by suggesting that if you're not wild and crazy, then you're inhibited. If you're not constantly trying new things, you're inhibited. And I want to challenge that just as much as I want to challenge artificial restrictions and restraints on people's sexual expression. I, I think my, my thing is give yourself permission to be open to the idea to be, to, not to limit yourself. You well, know? sure. I mean, who could argue with that? You know, I, my thing is give yourself permission to be spontaneous and creative if the urge hits you. Don't feel that you have to get in a rut and do the same thing over and over again. I mean, if, if you get a spontaneous idea, go with it, you know. Give yourself permission to just do something nuts if you want to. If you don't, don't. But if you want to, go with it. Some people automatically, when they think about the idea of corn of any kind, they immediately 
mentally and emotionally go to a place of pain. Okay, they just, they don't even want to think about the idea. They, they won't even consider that it could have any kind of beneficial, well, it, it could be beneficial in any way whatsoever. And there, there can be some beneficial elements to it. Okay, and they, they just want to think, don't, don't you realize the pain this causes me? Don't you understand how, how just, it, this hurts me to even think about my partner considering, you know, watching it, watching it, any, anything at all. What what do you say to a person that just has that immediate reaction to the idea of porn? Well, as a therapist, I'm always asking people for more information. I'm always asking people, tell me what you mean, tell me what you mean, tell me what you mean. I'm always <laughs> asking people, so what is it about your partner looking at porn that's, that's painful for you? And when people say, I don't know, it just is, I say, well... If you really want to understand things better, we, we need to go a little deeper. And um, I'm always asking people, what do you mean and what's the problem with that? So if someone says, it's painful for me that, uh, that my partner might be having an orgasm while thinking about another person or an actress or a character in a movie, then my response to that is, you know, what, what exactly is painful about that for you? And again, when people say, well, I don't know, it just is, I say, well, you know, we have to, we have to go a little deeper than that. We have to go a little deeper than that. And I think that in the current anti-porn climate, uh, people give themselves permission to not think very deeply about it. People, too many people give themselves permission to say, I don't know, or that's just the way I am, or that's, that's, that's how normal people are. And that's just not good enough. So I think, I think that when, uh, when a sexual relationship is working pretty well, I think that people are not nearly so concerned about their partner masturbating or their partner looking at porn. But I think when, when relationships or sexual relationships are problematic, that's when people start to start to get uncomfortable about their partner having sexual fantasies about other people or ejaculating while, you know, looking at movies of somebody else. And that's why in the title of my new book, His Porn, Her Pain, I say that people need honest talk about sex as the way around the, to, uh, as a way of resolving problems around, uh, around pornography, that it's the honest talking about sex that people are not doing. And instead they're quarreling about pornography. Quarreling about mm-hmm. pornography is much easier than talking honestly about sex. Have you found too that when they're arguing about porn, they're really arguing about other things? Well, yeah. I think one of the main things that people are quarreling about when they quarrel about porn is power. People are struggling about who's going who's gonna to define this relationship, who's going to define what you can and cannot do? Who's going to define what you can and cannot think about or fantasize about? Who's going to define how you experience and express your sexuality? Now, exactly. ideally, ideally, people would work this all out before they signed their relationship contract. <laughs> but the truth sure. is, the truth is that nobody works everything out before they sign their relationship contract. Now, I, I have an office where I do therapy, and I have a lease, and the lease is eight pages long, and it covers everything. You know, what I can expect, and what are my responsibilities, what my landlord can expect, and what are her responsibilities. So it's eight pages for an office. Now, uh, when, when people sign up to be in a couple, that's a much more serious and, and much more comprehensive arrangement, and yet very, very few people have enough conversations about how our couple is going to be to fill up an eight-page contract. So while it would be ideal if people worked out a lot of relationship details before they coupled up, most people don't. And then, and then um, when someone does something that the other person finds profoundly upsetting, then the pushing and shoving starts. I want us right. to live this way. No, I want us to live this way. No, I want us to live this way. And and if the subject is pornography, a lot of times people will bring in, well, you know, here's what's wrong with pornography, and that's why you shouldn't watch it. And the other person will say, well, here's what's right with pornography, and that's why it's okay for me to watch it. Rather than having a much deeper conversation, which is, what do we want to do when one of us wants to do something that the other one doesn't want them to do? 
that's a much more serious conversation. Most definitely. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, it, yes, if, if your office lease is eight pages, uh, a marriage, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that would postpone the wedding a little bit. <laughs> so you have something I, I hear called a porn literacy checklist. Yes, my famous porn literacy checklist. <laughs> Let's start by talking about porn literacy. Porn literacy well, every, everyone has heard about media literacy. That's an idea that people talked about uh, some 20, 30 years ago. We started to realize the comprehensive nature of the media's influence in our lives and the need for people to really understand what goes into media productions and the fact that the fact that a news story might be uh, biased or something like that. So uh, pornography is a kind of a media. It's a kind of media. And mm-hmm. we need literacy if we're going to use this, this medium. We need to understand certain things about the way that pornography as a medium is, is constructed. Not because there's something bad about pornography, but because it's, uh, it has so much influence in our lives. So... Uh, what I do in, in my new book, in addition to talking about porn literacy in general, I have a porn literacy checklist. Ostensibly, it's for parents who are concerned about their kids having access to porn and what parents need, um, what kids need to know and what parents need to, to make sure the kids understand if they're going to look at porn. So, for example, um, kids need to understand that porn is not a documentary. But, you know, everybody needs to understand that. Every consumer of porn needs to understand that porn is not a documentary. And kids need to understand that porn is not, um, it's not created uh, in, in real time, you know, it's edited, it's put together. So something that looks like it, it was a nine-minute sequence actually took place um, in three different, three different time periods and then stitched together, um, just like a podcast, right? So, right. <laughs> so, uh, so this porn literacy checklist, which is... Um, which is in my book, um, it's, it's simultaneously, it's a way for parents to conceptualize what their kids need to know about porn. And it's also a way for adults to, um, to sort of check in with themselves about, do I really understand the product that I'm using? And not because, again, not because porn is bad, but because this is a product that, um, that can be, um, that can be really powerful in our lives. And we want to make sure that, that we, um, that we understand what we're consuming. Well, that's it. You, you need to understand a product that you're going to consume on a regular basis. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, a lot of people need to understand TV programs that they watch. I mean, it, it's amazing the people that act like the fictional characters in their favorite TV shows are their neighbors. I mean, honest uh-huh. to goodness, people don't get it. <laughs> you know? Well, here's another example. Um, if you know those those 10 p.m. Uh, crime dramas like CSI and you know all those things where somebody gets uh, somebody gets murdered and you know torn apart and then you know it's up to these good-looking cops to figure out who did it and, and all that. People who watch those shows consistently overestimate the amount of crime that there is in real life that there is in the United States. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't watch those shows. But if you're going to watch those shows, um, I think it would be valuable if people understood that those shows are not a fair representation of what goes on in the real world. Now, you know, in general, fiction, you know, only bears some similarity, but it's not identical to the real world. That's why it's fiction. But people who watch those those shows hour after hour, week after week, um, they need to um, they need to be really clear that that they're watching a very extreme version of something that goes on rarely in the United States, and that's different from the way that people are watching it now. So I would like for people to have media literacy about those things as well as uh, as well as as every other media product. And that's it. Well, that's like, you know, every mystery novelist doesn't really run into a murder victim every time they go out of town. It doesn't really happen right. that way. You right. know? Right. It, 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 wow. Just, it, and, and every murder case isn't solved in an hour. It really doesn't happen that way out here in the real world. So. Yeah, solving murder cases is actually very tedious. 
Yeah, it, the justice it's system in general, because I do a and, lot of expert every, witnessing about sexuality, you know, and and the yeah. whole court, the whole justice system. I mean, it should it shouldn't be glamorous. It should be tedious. Um, yeah. But you wouldn't know that because if it's like it's like in pornography, if you if you had 20 minutes of people hugging, that would be really boring to watch. And if you had 20 minutes of a detective uh, going through lists and lists and lists of this thing or that thing, it would be really boring to watch. So uh, we need to keep in mind that both pornography and murder mysteries you know, they take some liberties with the truth. Yeah, I mean, they're fiction. They're fiction. It's, it. it's called fiction for a reason. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like you write a novel and you feel like you should, like, explain what, what fiction is at the beginning, you know? I, I was doing research for, for a novel, and I, I got in touch with the local historic society, and I was going to... I like to incorporate a lot of, of reality in my historical stuff, but I also play with it a little bit to make it fit my story. I mean, the historic society was like all up in arms about something. And she goes, it didn't really happen. I'm like, I'm writing a novel. It doesn't have to have happened. But, yeah, we, boy, that got ugly. <laughs> so, so what what do you feel about the idea of kids getting sex education from porn? Well, pornography is an adult product. Pornography is a product that's made for adults. And uh, kids shouldn't be using it. It's real simple. Kids should not be using porn because it's not made for them. And, right. And... Um, and nevertheless, like a lot of other things that we think that kids should not do, kids, kids use porn. And um, unfortunately, kids are looking at porn and thinking, oh, that's what sex is about. And, you know, every, every healthy kid is curious about sex. Every, every healthy kid is curious about sex. And so um, if you feel like you can't ask a trusted adult your questions, and if you can't watch grown-ups having sex, and if you get inadequate or worse sex education in school, then where are you going to go to get your questions answered? So a lot of kids are looking at porn, whether it's, uh, you know, sort of the conventional 30-minute video uh, or whether it's going to Tumblr or whether it's going to to yak or you know one of those other um sites kids are going there to try and figure out what do naked bodies look like and what does sex actually look like and what do people do and people who seem to know what they're doing how do they do this thing or that thing and it's really unfortunate i mean i think everybody on on every side of whatever the debate is about pornography, I think everybody agrees that pornography is not where we want kids getting their sex education because pornography is fiction. You know, it's unusual bodies in unusual situations doing unusual things with unusual results. Right. Porn, porn's not a documentary. You know, most people don't look like that. Most people don't sound like that. Most people don't feel like the characters in porn feel when they're having sex. So, so it's it's a it's not a good thing that kids are getting sex education from porn. It would be nice if there were some really good sex education that was mandatory for every kid in the United States. Uh, and, and that it was comprehensive se sexuality education that covered not just fallopian tubes, uh, not just uh, stay away from sex because you'll get a disease that'll kill you, but really, um, really help kids uh, explore why do people have sex and, and why do they do what they do when they have sex and how do you pick a, a sexual partner and how do you know if you're having a good time and what does a good time actually mean? And, um, but that comprehensive kind of sexuality education is very far away from us right now. And so we're, um, we're dumping our kids in the lap of pornography and then complaining about the results of when we dump them in the lack of porno in the lap of pornography. It really there there should be a healthy way to do it, but it I, I don't see it anywhere in the near future. I really don't see it happening. But it would it would really be good for because kids need something something healthy. They need a healthy alternative to help them understand and to, like I said I don't I don't see it anywhere 
I don't see the two sides coming together anytime in the near future, unfortunately. Well, my goal is to get away from the idea that there have to be two sides. That's why when people say you pro porn, yeah. I say no, I'm not pro porn. <laughs> I'm pro healthy, healthy childhood. You know, I'm pro healthy sexual relationships. I'm pro healthy sexual decision making. Putting the the health of the children ahead of all the other hoopla would be a really good thing to do. Now, what do you mean by narratives of porn? Well, I think the question is narratives about porn, and that is, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what stories is the culture telling itself about pornography? You know, just like there are narratives about sports, what stories does the culture tell itself about sports? You know, the uh, American culture tells itself that sports are a healthy thing to do, they're a healthy thing to watch, they're a fun thing to watch, they're something that families can enjoy doing together. There's very little in today's narrative about sports, about danger. We're just starting to get this whole concussion thing about football. But but for the most part, the narrative about sports in America is very positive, and it speaks to everyone's eligibility. You know, every in America, everyone is encouraged to participate in some kind of sport, even if it's just walking. And certainly everybody in America is encouraged to watch sports on TV um, or live, regardless of age, regardless of, of anything else. So what is the narrative about pornography? Well, historically, the narrative about pornography has been that it's immoral. And one of the reasons that it's, um, it's been considered immoral is because using pornography is connected with masturbation. And historically, masturbation was considered by organized religion to be a sin. So watching pornography, which is an aid to masturbation, has historically been considered immoral. It's also been considered immoral because it's somebody who is deliberately inflaming their own sexual desire. And, and for a long time, that was, um, that was considered immoral as well. So here we are in the United States, and we're cruising along in the 50s and 60s, and uh, pornography is considered immoral. People, people use it, but pornography is considered immoral. Um, sometime in the, in the 70s and 80s, that started to change. And the, the cultural narrative about pornography, which is that, which had been people who use pornography are immoral or people who use pornography are doing an immoral thing and hurting themselves, that anti-pornography critique began to morph into looking at pornography is not immoral, it's dangerous, it's, it's a public health issue. And so the question of somebody looking at pornography changed from whether or not it's dangerous for the user to whether or not it's dangerous for everybody, whether or not it's dangerous for the user's marriage, the user's family, the user's community, if it's dangerous for all women. And so that narrative uh, got cemented in with the arrival of broadband in the year 2000 when pornography came into everyone's home through broadband internet. And so now um, what, you, what you hear is very little about it's immoral. Now what you hear is it's dangerous for society at large and it's dangerous for um, marriages and children and this and that. The, the importance of that change is that when pornography was simply considered immoral, the main people who talked about it were religious figures. And indeed, religious figures were very prominent in the anti-pornography movement of the 50s and uh, early 60s. There's lots and lots of documentation about that. But now, but now, with the idea that pornography poses... Uh, dangers to public health. Now, everybody is invited in um, to critique pornography. So the anti-trafficking people, the anti-sex work people, the anti-child molestation people, the anti-divorce people, the anti-porn addiction people, lots and lots of new stakeholders have been created as part of this new anti-porn narrative. And so when there's any sort of a conference about what are we going to do about pornography or there's any sort of public hearing about how do we prevent a new adult bookstore from coming into town or something like that, it's not simply religious people who get 
to have an opinion about it. It's all these different activists, uh, many of whom are doing very important work, um, but it's all these it's all these activists who don't who know nothing about pornography, who now are considered to have a legitimate voice in critiquing porn, and as a result. Um, you have uh, you have all these people who are using porn on one side of the divide, and all these other moral entrepreneurs uh, on the other side who are saying that we have to wipe out this this scourge, you know, this this awful uh, deadly epidemic, you know, rather than just seeing it as um, as something that people do privately. Interesting, moral entrepreneurs. I like that. That's an interesting term. Huh. Yeah, moral entrepreneurs. I mean, if if you think about moral panics, if you think right. about moral panics, a moral panic is when there's a there's an overblown, exaggerated, temporary, usually social phenomenon where the media and public figures whip up anxiety that's all out of proportion to the actual danger. Exactly. Um, and. And, and everybody's sort of everybody's supposed to mobilize to quarantine this this danger. We've seen that before, for example, with um, with comic book burning in the '40s, right. where people thought that comic books were dangerous and created juvenile delinquency. We saw it um, in the '50s with rock and roll, uh, where there were record burnings, and where um, when Elvis Presley was uh, was on Ed Sullivan. Uh, the camera people were famously instructed to not shoot Elvis Presley from the belly down because showing his gyrating pelvis, you know, was considered to be dangerous. We've seen this with with supposed satanic abuse where where supposedly in preschools, teachers uh, have these rituals of forcing children to have sex with each other and, you know, drink each other's blood and stuff like that. People, people went to jail for that. So periodically we see these moral panics centered around sexuality in the United States, you know, as far back as the witch burnings, which, uh, you know, is a moral panic as well, which is supposedly were causing crops to fail and causing people to turn into animals and stuff like that. So the, the, the anxiety about pornography now is, in fact, the latest moral panic in the United States about sexuality, and I call it porn panic. One word, porn panic. Moral panic about pornography, porn panic. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I like that. Okay. So... What do you mean by the voice of the porn consumer is missing in the, the cultural conversation about porn? Well, I'm glad you asked me that. If, if, the government, if the American government were to pass a special tax on particularly fatty meat, let's say uh, ribs, <laughs> let's say ribs, yeah. if, the, if the government decided, you know, um, ribs, are not healthy for people, and so we're going to pass an extra tax on ribs. Or, as happened in New York City, when they tried to pass a special tax on extra large soda. Mm -hmm. Um, If the government, whenever the government tries to pass a special tax or special law regulating a certain industry, there's usually, predictably, there's the government uh, advocating its position, There's the manufacturers uh, advocating their position, and there's the consumers advocating their position. So if if the government tried to pass a tax on fatty ribs, the rib manufacturers, you know, the meat packers, you know, they would get to testify at congressional hearings, and they would say, no, 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 actually, ribs are really healthy. And and then there would be the uh, American uh, Rib Consumers Association. You know, they would get to testify and say, oh, ribs is a... My grandfather used to feed me ribs, and I feed my grandchildren ribs, and ribs are really great. And so, and, and then, you know, the government would decide what to do. Well, with pornography, what you have, whenever the government tries to regulate pornography, or whenever there are hearings about just exactly how damaging is pornography, what you get is you get a whole lot of people saying how bad it is, as I just talked about these new stakeholders about how it supposedly contributes to sex trafficking and supposedly contributes to uh, kids, you know, getting molested and all that. 
Um, so you have all these people showing up saying how bad porn is, but you never, you, you know, there is no porn consumers association, obviously. And um, while there is a porn producers association, neither group is ever invited to the table when the government is talking about restricting porn or when there's some sort of round table about what's problematic about pornography. So you have 60 million consumers. That, that's more people That's more people than eat ribs in the United States. You know, that's, <laughs> that, I mean, that, that, 60 million people, that's a lot of people. That's as much um, as, like, that's more than all the people in California. That's more than all the people in New York. That's more than all the people in Texas, right? So you have 60 million consumers of a product and the government get, is give, giving itself permission to try and regulate this product without talking to consumers. Where is the consumer's voice? And when, and when psychologists sit around and talk about how awful it is that people are using pornography, uh, psychologists never talk to porn consumers about why do you do this and what, do you think it's beneficial and why do you think it's not you know, bad for you and all of that. The voice of porn consumers is conspicuously absent in any discussion of pornography, whether it's on the policy level, whether it's on the cultural level, whether it's on, this, uh, on the level of the psychology profession, no matter, what, no matter what level you look at, the voice of porn consumers is conspicuously missing. Interesting. Interesting. Yep, because, I, I mean, normally, if, if you're going to regulate something, and I mean, I, I realize this is not, how the government seems to work. But, I mean, you should call in people who can actually testify with some intelligence. And here again, I am talking about the government, so intelligence doesn't really apply. But you should call in people who can actually give you some educated information about it to make a logical decision. But, okay, logical, yeah, okay. There, there's another one. That does, not happen, that does not happen with pornography. Instead, victims... People who present themselves as victims of pornography, they have a voice. People who present themselves as being concerned about children, uh, they get to have a voice. Consumers never get to have a voice. And if it were any other product, if it were any other product, or, or to put it even more strongly, when it's any other product, of course consumers are involved because that's the way a democracy works. You know, in Iran, they do whatever, the government does whatever it wants. Here... If we're going to pass a special tax on the ballet, you know, all the ballet lovers would show up and the ballet producers would show up. And people who thought ballet was a terrible thing, their voice would be counterbalanced by the producers of the product and the consumers of the product. And we don't hmm. have that with pornography. Now, when I say something like this, people say, well, that shows that you're pro-pornography. I'm not pro-pornography. This is a form of sexual expression that's very, very common and that most consumers say um, contributes positively to their lives. So as a, as a person who's a specialist in sexual health and sexual expression, I need to hear those voices. And I think that the, the fact that those voices are missing makes it very difficult to have a sane policy in the United States about sexually explicit material. Yeah, that's true. If somebody were to ask what some of the benefits of pornography are, what are some of the benefits you would tell them? You know, I don't talk much about the benefits. I think the main benefit of looking at pornography is that people, people experience their right to express their sexuality in any consenting way that they want. And I think that it's good for people to, to feel permission to fantasize about whatever they want to fantasize about rather than being afraid that their fantasies have some dark meaning. Or I think it's, it's, it's a good thing for people to give themselves permission to imagine what it would be like to do this activity or that activity, is, of course, as long as it's consenting. That's really the, the, the benefit that I'm tuned into. I hear other, you know, some consumers, they say, um, it gives me new ideas so that uh, my partner and I don't get into a rut. Some people say um, it, it, it helps me masturbate and I'm in a, in a relationship where there's no sex and so that's a good thing. Some people say it, it, it does give them some uh, accurate information about genital physiology. 
And, you know, for people who have never seen a clitoris, pornography is a godsend, right? Because there are lots and lots of clitorises in, uh, in pornography. People, people who complain, people complain that, that porn hates women and is against women and all of that, they obviously haven't looked at very much porn because porn is um, hugely, hugely features uh, clitorises and female orgasms. So, uh, so for some people, there's a benefit in seeing that there's a clitoris and that, and that um, at least act, some actresses portray sexual pleasure deriving from clitoral stimulation. Um, you can, another benefit is that you can see that it's okay for a man to touch his penis during sex. It's okay for a woman to touch her vulva during sex. That's a message that I think all um, sexually healthy people I uh, think is a, is a good message. Uh, certainly all sex educators are always talking about that. And you can, you can see that it's okay to, uh, that you don't have to ejaculate inside of a woman if you're heterosexual. Um, so, you know, those are some positive things that you can observe or some positive experiences you can have. I stay away, for the most part, I stay away from, you know, the good, the, you know, what are the benefits of porn because I don't think there need to be benefits of porn. You know, porn is, in a free society, porn is a form of uh, a form of artistic expression that um, that needs to be side by side with the ballet and the New York Times. And uh, if people want to look at it, um, let them look at it. And if they find it beneficial, they find it beneficial. If they don't like what they're looking at, they shouldn't look at it. There you go. Well, that's that's very true. So what about some people who say, well, well, don't you realize that, that you know, rapists and child molesters are, are the only people to look at porn, and, and it, it inspires people to do all these horrible things? What, what do you well, ra- tell well rapists and child molesters are not the only people who look at porn. Um, this is true. <laughs> I, I, I'm, always, I'm always intrigued by these claims that rapists, that everybody who looks at porn goes out and rapes somebody because there's 60 million people looking at porn every month in America alone. And, and obviously, they're not all going out and committing rapes. So, um, but what some people do say is, well, what about all these rapists or child molesters who say, yeah, I look at porn? And the answer is they also, also say, um, yeah, I, I drink milk or I drink coffee. Or, um, I mean, the truth is that when you have a product that's used by so many people, if you round up a thousand of any group, if you get a thousand Italians or a thousand Yankees fans or a thousand left-handed people or a thousand red-haired people or a thousand people who like sushi, if you get a thousand of any group of people, a large percentage of those people look at pornography because it's such a commonly used product. So to say that... um, a large percentage of rapists and child molesters look at porn. Well, of course they do. A large percentage of every group looks at porn. So, you know, that's, that's correct. A large percentage of rapists and child molesters use porn. So what exactly is your point? So you know, I bet I you a large number of those people also watch the nightly news. Yeah, of course. Of course. You know, so what about people saying that, uh, or, or even science saying that porn leads to aggression and sexual violence? Well, the science is mostly good news about this. The science is that um, the science is that there's a very, very tiny, tiny sliver of people, a tiny sliver of people, um, for whom watching a certain kind of pornography seems to excite aggression. But um, it's not all people and it's not all porn. It's, it, 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 you, have to, you have to have very special circumstances. Um, if a person is already a highly aggressive individual, which is not most people, and mm-hmm. if that person has a high sex drive, which is not all people, and if that person um, already has concerns about their masculinity, which is not all people. And if that person watches particularly aggressive and violent porn, which is a, a tiny sliver of, most, uh, of porn, um, then watching that kind of aggressive, violent porn under those conditions, according to science, seems to excite um, aggressive tendencies. Does that mean that they go and rape somebody? No, it means that it excites aggressive tendencies. 
Other than that, other than that, if you take a thousand people off of the street and show them porn, they're no more likely to to be violent or aggressive or anti-woman um, than a thousand people who don't watch porn. So, um, so that's good news. I mean, the, there are a couple of old studies that were done on college students where, back in the 60s and 70s, where uh, college student, college males, you know, were shown pornography, and then they were given the they had to make decisions about um, about shocking, uh, elect, uh, you know, electrically shocking um, a, a, a female volunteer. As it turns out, the electrical shocks, you know, didn't exist. But, you know, the idea was to measure what happens when you show college males porn and then you uh, give them the chance to shock women, how much do they ratchet it up? And at the time the college males were not given the option of you get to talk to her instead of shocking her. When the, so, so the experiments indeed showed that after you, after you show college males porn and you tell them to go shock a female, yeah, they'll go shock a female. That happens to be true if you, if you show people things that are not porn. It turns out that there's a lot of people that if you say, here's an opportunity to administer an electric shock to somebody, please do it, they do it which is sort of an, uh, another interesting uh, conversation. But uh, when, those, when Bill Fisher and, and, his, and his crowd at, at Western Ontario University, when they tried to replicate those experiments and they gave the college males the option of just talking to the women, they, they talked to the women instead of shocking them. So, uh, again, um, the idea that people look at porn and then they go out and they commit all these violent, aggressive acts, it, it turns out to not be true. Which so is pretty much I whatever mean, option. This is good news. So, so whatever option you gave them, they're willing to take it. <laughs> well, people are funny. Um, people, if you put people in a lab and you tell them to, and you're wearing a white coat and you tell them to do stuff, it's surprising right. how many people will do stuff. It, it really is. <laughs> That coat has such power. Interesting. So what about the idea of porn addiction? Is, is there such a thing, do you think? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, in my book, I have a whole chapter about is there such a thing as porn addiction? And I was around in the 1980s when sex addiction was invented. And for 30 years, I've been talking about why sex addiction is not a helpful uh, a helpful way to describe sexual behavior, and so after, uh, and so then I predicted that sooner or later there, we would be seeing people invent uh, porn addiction, and indeed that has come to pass. And the idea uh, behind the concept of porn addiction is that there's something about pornography and the incredible instant reward uh, involved that uh, that is addictive, and that once people get involved with pornography, they can't stop. You know, that's such a disrespectful idea. It's disrespectful to real addiction. If, if you've ever had the misfortune to deal with people who are addicted, really addicted to alcohol or heroin or Oxycontin or something like that, which I do professionally, if, if you watch those people go through withdrawal, it is hell on earth. If you watch people withdraw from alcohol or, or painkillers or uh, something like that, they're constantly nauseous, they're trembling, they're vomiting, they can't sleep, they hallucinate, uh, they can't focus their eyes. It's just horrible. If, on the other hand, you take a person who is supposedly a porn addict and you take away their porn, you know what happens? They get crabby. <laughs> not not the quite con the, same the contrast. Thing. The contrast is startling. They get crabby. And I think that the main reason they get crabby is because when people voluntarily give up pornography, they almost invariably also give up masturbation. And uh -huh. so what people are really crabby about, I think, is that they're giving up masturbation, not that they're giving up pornography. But right. I, I understand that people who are, who are habituated to looking at porn, they like looking at porn, and then if they stop looking at porn, they, they don't want to stop looking at porn. I totally get that. The idea that it's addictive, though, it removes the decision-making power from people, and it says that there's something about consuming this product that changes the way that, 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 people, um, that people behave or make decisions. And that's just nonsense. That's just nonsense. I think that there's a lot of people who use porn in self-destructive ways. 
People sit down to look at porn and masturbate for 15 minutes, and before you know it, two hours have gone by. Sure, I see those people as patients in my office every week. Um, But that's not because porn has addicted them. That's because they have found something that they can use to medicate themselves, medicate their depression, medicate their anxiety. They found something that they can use to kill time because the only thing in their lives that's meaningful is their work. Um, They... um, They use porn a couple of hours a night because uh, they want to stay away from their mate who they don't get along with or who uh, wants sex that they don't want to have. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that people would use porn to medicate themselves in the same way that some people use shopping or the same way that some people use surfing the net or some people use Facebooking. There's a lot of reasons that people would do that. Um, But it's only uh, the sex negativity of American culture that suggests that the exact same behavior um, when the object is pornography that, that when the behavior is pornography, it's addictive, but when the activity is Facebooking, it's a hobby. It's only right. our sex negativity as a culture that singles out that kind of um, uh, that kind of habitual behavior with pornography that singles it out as that's that's addictive. Uh, there's there's no data. There's absolutely no data to suggest that there's any brain rewiring that goes on, or there's any metabolic changes. I mean the the, the hallmark of real addiction is that there are metabolic changes in the body, that the body's ability to metabolize uh, the, the, the body of an alcoholic and the way that that, that person's body relates to alcohol is different from the way that a non-alcoholic's body relates to alcohol. And that's true of heroin and everything else. The body's relationship to that substance is different in an addict. Well, the body's relationship to pornography is not different in an addict than in a casual user. Yeah, I, have, I have a whole chapter about that in my book. Actually, you know, people ask me about my career. Here's sort of a quirky thing about my career. If you go to Wikipedia, if you look up sex addiction, I'm listed as a prominent critic of sex addiction. So that's one of my great accomplishments. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so knew I, you were actually, so that, that's why I had to ask you about porn addiction. So. <laughs> so, I, so I've been writing about porn addiction for a long time. I see people who are involved in pornography in an unhealthy way in my office every week. The fact that I know that there's no such thing as porn addiction does not mean I don't see people who are self-destructively involved with pornography. No, no, no. That's just a silly idea. That's how I make a living. I'm well known in my community as someone who deals with that. So well, there's you, a whole chapter can, in my book about that. You can use something in a destructive way without it being an addiction, though. Well, of course. I'm like that with chocolate chip cookies. My doctor is <laughs> telling me to stop. And if I were to say to my doctor, I can't help it, I'm addicted, my doctor would say, hey, come on, be serious. So come on now. <laughs> he, would, he would say to me, he would say to me, you need to take responsibility about your decision making around cookies and not screw around with this idea that you're addicted and that you can't help yourself. That's especially right. around holiday time, I say, doc, especially around holiday time, I just can't help myself. My doctor would say, look, you're an adult. You have to learn how to deal with the fact that there's cookies everywhere in December. What are you going to do about it? And, and you know, that's an important question. That's an important question for anybody who is vulnerable to bad decision making, whether it's about cookies or pornography or anything else. <laughs> See, it, it's, it's all in the chocolate chips. You just got to learn how to handle them. Even the really, really good chocolate chips, you have to do it. So a couple other things in my new book before we close for today. A couple Mm -hmm. other things in my new book that people would be interested in is why women do not have to compete with actresses. Women sometimes say, "Uh, I don't want him looking at porn because I can't compete with actresses. So there's a chapter in there about no, Mabel, you don't have to compete with porn actresses. There's stuff in there about how to talk to your kids about porn. There's stuff in the new book about, uh, well, what is the social science data about how what has happened in American culture since the introduction of free 24-7 porn? What has happened with, say, the rates of sexual violence and divorce? There's stuff about that. Um, there's stuff in there, um, sample conversations that couples can have with each other if there's conflict about porn so they can kind of settle the issue once and for all and get on with the rest of their lives. Um, there's stuff in the new book for people who are concerned that they are involved with porn in an unhealthy way 
or if, if, they, if somebody has a loved one and they're concerned that their loved one is, con- is involved with porn in an unhealthy way. And then there's a, a separate chapter just for professionals, just for uh, social workers and, and uh, therapists and priests and ministers and so on, pr- and physicians, uh, material just for professionals um, who want to get a little more savvy about how to talk to their clients or patients about pornography. It's my seventh book, and, uh, and I kind of like it. I think it's a pretty good book. Awesome. What about sexting? Any thoughts about sexting you want to share with the audience? I think you're old enough. I know I'm old enough. I I think you're old enough to remember um, the first rocket that left the Earth and landed on the moon. That was a pretty powerful rocket, and it was powered by a pretty powerful computer. The computer that sent the rocket to the moon is slightly less powerful than the computer in your iPhone which is to say that every 15-year-old has a computer in his or her pocket that's that's powerful enough to send a rocket to the moon, assuming you have enough gasoline, right? Uh, (laughs) But seriously, every teenager has a computer in their pocket that is as as powerful as the computer that sent a rocket, successfully sent a rocket to the moon. We give these computers to 15-year-old kids We give these computers to kids who can't even wash the dishes. We give these computers to kids, and then we complain when they use them. I mean, what would any reasonable person do with any new invention that they had access to? Every new technology in Western history is immediately adapted for sexual uses as soon as possible. When rubber was, was a first, uh, first synthesized, it was used for condoms. When the printing press was first invented, it was used for sexy novels. When the car was invented, it was used by people to get out of town and have privacy to have sex. When DVDs were invented, they were immediately, immediately used for pornography. Every new technology is immediately adapted for sexual uses. And it's the same thing with the computers that kids put in their pockets. The first thing they want to do with them is talk to their friends. And the second thing they want to do with them is send or receive sexy pictures. And... Why anybody is surprised by this is beyond me. Of course they're going to do that. Now, the question is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? What do we want to do about it? Yeah, we need to pay attention to this. I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to stop throwing kids into jail for doing this because that's not helping anybody. We do need to educate kids about why this is not a good idea. And it's not a good idea. But it's an obvious thing that any reasonable 15-year-old would do. It's not like, you know, these kids are eating dirt. (laughs) It's not like they're trying to fly to Venus. No, these kids are doing the most obvious, logical thing in the world. What is every 15-year-old interested in? Other kids' bodies. So, of course, they're using their little pocket computers to, to sex with each other. What we need to do is, you know, talk about this as part of a more comprehensive conversation about sexuality, which, of course, most parents don't want to do so um, telling kids to just not do it is is not going to be very helpful we need to sit kids down and explain that I totally get why you want to do this now let's talk about what you want to do instead what you might want to do instead Um, let's talk about why you might want to postpone doing this let's talk about under what circumstances would this be a reasonable thing to do that's a much more complicated conversation than most parents want to have with kids and I'm very sympathetic about that I mean nobody wants to talk to their kids about sex people are willing to talk to uh, talk to their kids about sex when their kids are about 40 years old Uh, (laughs) so I'm very sympathetic about this but um, but sexting itself is is only is only a problem if if people are using it to hurt each other and of course there are people who will use sexting to hurt each other but yeah. that's part of a more general a more general principle about why it's important for people to not hurt each other and we need to have more conversations about that Un- until until young people are better at not hurting each other, and they're no worse at it than adults. Adults hurt each other too. Until young people are better at not hurting each other, they need to understand that there are certain things that they can do that can make it easier for people to hurt them and that they need to be more thoughtful about whether or not to do that. So that's my take on sexting. All right. Well, I actually, do you want to give the listeners your 
website addresses? Because I actually, I think MartyKlein.com is one of your sites. Yes, I was, it is. I was MartyKlein.com. Good... But if you can't spell that, here's a really easy one. <laughs> sexed.org. S-E-X-E-D dot O-R-G. Klein, uh, my, my uh, email address is Klein at sexed.org. My website is www.sexed.org and there you will find lots of uh, information about sex uh, descriptions of all my books um, including stuff about my new book which is uh, His Porn, Her Pain, Colin uh, Confronting America's Porn Panic with Honest Talk About Sex Well it was great having you with me today and I hope the audience got lots of great information and for a replay about the show link to Dr. Klein's website more information about him just go to my website at readyforloveradio.com slash his porn her pain. And listeners, I'll see you next time on Ready for Love Radio.